morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, celebration of Thanksgiving for the life of our good friend, Ed Marshall. Strangely enough, that music is a wonderful place of convergence that I need to explain, because this whole next hour is going to be a wonderful tribute to the richness in Ted's life. Now, to those of you who are familiar with Salvation Army hymnody and songs, that was the Christ of Calvary. And for those of you who thought it was Annie Laurie with a brilliant new treatment, how did all that passion get squeezed out of that homage to Annie Laurie? Well, back in the day when the roots of the Salvation Army were being planted in Great Britain, the songs of the times were used. Familiar things were added to what we called our songs. And even the pub songs and other tunes that would have been known in those days were used to the honor and glory of God. And thus you have a song like Annie Laurie that has been given a very deep context, far deeper than the song originally contained. But because of the beauty of the melody and the eloquence of the words, now we have a wonderful treatment which really points heavenward to the Christ of Calvary. On behalf of Eva and Len and Paula, I welcome you here to this hour, which is indeed going to be very, very unique. It's going to blend together the, uh, the streams of Ted's life. It's a confluence. You're going to hear music and words and scripture which represent our dear friend's life. He was born into this uh, unique organization, the Salvation Army. It was his church home, and it was also the place where he learned music, and he played the trombone, and it was a great help. He had great ears, and of course, we know that the trombone section have the best ears in the Salvation Army world, because they, they have to tune to all of the, uh, the untunables from across the other side of the aisle. He was a trombone player, and he brought that capacity of a mu as a musician to his art as a recordist. But this is also a, uh, a place where family uh, suggests their memories. This is also a place where uh, his, his, um, his friends within Salvation Army circles get to remember. This is also a place where the, well, I always knew that he was a closet Anglican. Because in my own association with him, um, uh, there was a recording we did together with the band and the Songster Brigade at Earl's Court. It was called Even Song. Now, we don't have an even song in the Salvation Army, but we wanted to have one. And indeed, the music on that recording is a kind of an eclectic and beautiful uh, mingling of uh, band and uh, choir music that we called Even Song, and I think it was Ted's suggestion. In retirement, when he retired to uh, Elora with Eva, they found fellowship within the St. John Evangelist Parish, and what a, a dear place in his heart he had for the men's fellowship and for many of his friends, for the music of St. John's. We're going to hear from their lovely parish choir. And so all of these uh, these streams come together in this hour that we spend together, as well as colleagues, people who've worked with Ted, who have sat along beside him. I've known him for 50 years myself, and I've known him from both sides of the recording studio as a pianist, uh, as a conductor, uh, as someone who uh, sat alongside of him while other bands were, uh, or other choirs were recording. I, I turned the pages of the score and suggested things into uh, 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 the recording situation. So I really spent a lot of time with Ted, uh, I guess on a kind of a professional level, but uh, as a friend as well. And for the last nine years before retirement, we were able to minister, Heather and I, at York Minster Corps, where uh, Ted and Eva and the family worship. So the Salvation Army to him was a place of worship and also a place of service. And we're going to hear from all of the other rich areas of Ted's life today.
hymns were important. He felt that uh, hymns were a place where our doctrine and our dogma were able to be uh, sung through the church and recited and uh, uh, given heart by the people. And here we have some hymns that have been chosen for us to sing that, it, that um, require faith. Uh, the faith that Ted possessed, the, the faith that he wanted to instill in others by the music that he invested in. So we're going to stand and sing a hymn together, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing My Great Redeemer's Praise. And the Canadian Staff Band will give us just a little intro before we begin the song. Would you like to stand if you're able? give our music into this air this morning. We breathe in and we make our music to your name, O oh God. And we honor the life of a dear friend who compelled us to be calm and to be peaceful in spirit. Thank you for his life. Thank you for this hour that we spend thinking, reminiscing, and enjoying the sounds of music to your glory. Let it be so. Amen. You may be seated. I, um, just before you come, Pauline, um, I have some dinner instructions which need to go somewhere, so they're going to go here before we, uh, we start our journey. And I would also um, like to say for those who are um, uh, new to this room, this is the Guelph Citadel core of the Salvation Army. This is uh, much like many other places of worship that the Salvation Army uh, has uh, possession of in our communities. And we're grateful to Guelph uh, for this opportunity to be here. And there is a congregation that worships here. And it is such a congregation that Ted had in his life at York Minster and at Earl's Court before that. Now, this group of musicians here that is sitting beside me, uh, they don't belong here. If you come next Sunday and expect to hear this group, you won't hear them. But you'll hear another fine group that is uh, uh, the uh, sort of the organ, the organ of this church, and our brass band music, I suppose in a way replaces the, uh, the keyboardist at uh, a partic any particular church. Now these ladies and gentlemen are from all over uh, southwestern Ontario, and they are brought together to be a part of this very, very fine group, and we're very proud of the Canadian staff band. And their executive officer, the figurehead person in charge of this group, is our, our, uh, our top gal, uh, Commissioner uh, Susan McMillan, and we're very pleased to have you, Commissioner, this morning with us worshiping and as a part of our uh, celebration of TED. Thank you. These two doors here lead directly to a room where the food will be on display. There are four tables. That makes two sides for each table. We can move through there lickety-split, and further on, uh, a little like a cow's stomach. You know, there's more than one further on into another room where we can sit and enjoy each other's company. Uh, Eva's told me that she's going to linger for a, li a little bit in the lobby 
anyone wants to see her that has to leave, do that. But we are, we are to just rush right in, get our grub, and to start the feast. Through to the first room here, and then on into the next room as we sit down. That's it for me for the moment. first scripture reading for this morning is from Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. brought back up. <laughs> Ted was three years old, three years and eight months old when I was born. He was okay with that, but three years later when Linda was born, he wanted to run away from home because there were enough girls in the house and he didn't need any more. Someone told him his new baby sister looked just like him, so not only did he decide to stay, but he insisted that the crib be in his bedroom. He became the big brother protector. Linda remembers a time when she got hit in the head with a basketball and he picked her up and carried her to mom. On the other hand, I remember getting in a fight in the schoolyard and threatening my opponent, opponent with, I'm gonna get my big brother. But when I called in big brother, he took in the situation and said, fight your own battles. <laughs> Ted did run away a few times. He would say he was leaving home. Mom would pack a few things in a bag and wave goodbye to him. <laughs> then she would phone Gran to say, Teddy's running away again. He'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> we moved out west when Ted was 14, so it wasn't as easy to run away to Gran's. But in the very same day that he wrote his last high school exam, he got on the Greyhound bus and went back to Toronto to live with Gran. I missed him, but I got his room. <laughs> he got a job, saved his money, and came home at Christmas. I still remember the gift he gave me that year. Some nice warm white mittens with a $2 bill tucked inside each one. You may not know that Ted didn't always want to be a recording technician. For a while, he wanted to be a garbage man. Then he was going to be a boxer. He would insist that I put on boxing gloves and box him. The reality was that I was his punching bag, <laughs> and, it, and it always ended with, with him knocking the wind out of me. Then he was going to be a rock star. He stood on a chair with his air guitar, singing and wiggling, and Linda and I were instructed to scream and try to touch him. 
But the first serious ambition he had was to be an architect. All through his teen years, he aspired to that. He drew elaborate plans for houses and other buildings. One time he showed mom and dad his plan for a Salvation Army Hall. It had everything, almost. Mom and dad looked it over and asked, where's the bathroom? It took him only a second to come back with, there's a gas station on the corner. <laughs> he was so serious about becoming an architect that he enrolled in architecture at Ryerson. That was in September, and when he came home in, at Christmas, he told us that he discovered that wasn't what he wanted to do. So he dropped out in, and enrolled in DeVry and found what he was really meant to do. I miss Ted's laugh. Anyone who, know, who knew him knows his unique way of laughing. I didn't always appreciate that laugh, though. When we were young, Ted would tease like a big brother, like a big brother does. I would get angry or upset, and the more upset I got, the more he laughed. I remember a time when I was in my early teens. He was sitting in a platform rocker, laughing until he had tears in his eyes. I was so mad at him, I pushed him over, chair and all. He laid there on the upturned chair, still laughing. <laughs> Another time he was teasing Lynn, and she somehow managed to get him on the floor and sit straddling him. She grabbed his hair with both her hands and banged his head on the floor while he still laughed at her. <laughs> we blame her for his thin hair. <laughs> I can't talk about childhood memories without mentioning his sleepwalking. We were camping one time and Ted got up wandering around the tent. When Dad asked him what he was doing, he said he was looking for the poles for the sleeping bags. Dad told him to go, in, to go get in bed and go to sleep. His answer was, you're the one who needs to go to sleep. Another time he was standing at the top of the stairs calling down to Dad, what, what should he do with the dollar from Mr. Foote for the empty, to empty stocking fund? Then there was the time that he came into our room and stood by our bed demanding, what did you do with the thing? We soon realized he was sleepwalking and we laughed. Wrong thing to do. He raised his fist and, and said, I am not walking in my sleep. I hope now he's in heaven, he's found the poles for the sleeping bags and the thing, and he knows what to do with the, that dollar. Goodbye, big brother, you are loved and missed. Just before I sing, Eva and I had a moment in the Tim Hortons parking lot in Fergus, and all she said to me was, one take, that's all you get. <laughs> and then I cried, and she said, that wasn't supposed to make you cry. <laughs> one take.
At Ted's funeral service, Reverend Paul Walker in his homily noted that Ted had two names. He was known as Ted to his friends and family and as Ed in his professional life. Actually, he had another name. He was known as Teddy when we were boys growing up in Toronto. Actually, because it was another Teddy, Ed, Teddy West, he was known as Teddy Marshall. This is a name that we grew up with. We first met in the Lisgar Street Citadel Salvation Army 504th Cub Pack. We were an unruly lot, mainly street kids from poor working class families. If there were a ranking of Cub Packs, we were probably somewhere around 503. But we had wonderful leaders from the church, as good and dedicated as you can get. Teddy Marshall came from a family were pillars in the church, and unlike us, he was quiet and well-behaved. <laughs> as it happened one year, we went to cup camp. As good as these leaders were, they could not cook to save their lives. So we were always hungry. One day after returning from an afternoon of frenetic cup activity, there was Teddy Marshall sitting at a picnic table in front of the supply tent in the process of devouring a complete loaf of bread in a jar of jam. This was not a puny, gluten-free, preservative-free loaf we get now. This was a man size of loaf of killer white. And I'm sure the jam was 100% sugar. Teddy Marshall conquered this in one sitting. Here was a real mensch. This began our lifelong friendship. After Teddy Marshall returned from a brief exile in North Battle for Saskatchewan, where his parents were Salvation Army officers, we joined the Aeroscoid Band. This began the next chapter in our friendship. It was here that he began to learn his skills as a recording engineer. We developed a love for classical music. I worked as an usher at Massey Hall, and Teddy Marshall began his career at CBC. Often in the evening, after my work was done, and he worked a late shift, he would invite me to the room at the old CBC building on Jarvis Street, where we would splice together news tapes for broadcasts in other time zones. He was, in fact, a pioneer of fake news even then. <laughs> Later, when he was living in Alora, I would sit in his studio and watch in amazement as he would do the same thing, only with music on a computer screen. I remember his face going red and his face growing up in frustration as he heard the second horn player's cack note or the sloppy entry of the sopranos. No problem. Lift a note from another take and replace the bad. Perfection. 
Katie Marsh was also a pioneer of fake music. <laughs> One day, I decided I wanted to get a stereo receiver. The problem was that they were expensive and I had no money. So I managed to buy a kit which was available at an electronic store on Young Street, but you had to put them together with a soldering iron. I remember Teddy Marshall coming to the house and seeing this impending disaster unfolding on the kitchen table. He had that same red face and pain look of frustration I've seen many times over the years. He proceeded to undo the mistakes I had made and with soldering iron in hand, worked all night to finish the project and it worked. Interestingly enough, when we chatted in the hospital during his last few weeks, he didn't remember this, but he remembered the bread and jam. His face beamed at this memory. This was how generous, steady, and unassuming he was. My mother always used to say, the slow and steady wins the race. But this last race with the terrible disease that he suffered with, Teddy Marshall was destined to lose as we all will also lose. But in my mind's eye, I can see Teddy Marshall feasting at the great banquet with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm certain there'll be more on the menu than just bread and jam. I bring tributes and personal memories from near and far. This message is from William Chinnery of Toronto. Thank you for your patience, generosity, and for teaching me all the things we both love. Ever since I was very young, you have been happy to involve me in what you are doing. You are a great role model to me, and I always look forward to our play dates. Thanks for being a great friend. This message is for Bram Gregson of London, Ontario. Your gift of friendship is one that I treasure, because without fail, you have acted with dignity and always been courteous. 
Your talents have enhanced the reputation of countless musical organizations, in particular Salvation Army bands. And other brass ensembles have attained standards beyond their expectations. For my ensembles, London Citadel Band, Entrada, and Brass Roots, you have been patient and always diligent, spiced occasionally with humor and grace by a humbler diligence that I have appreciated. Knowing you have enriched my life, and I am grateful. From Ron Wakes Norris of New York, I'm so sorry to hear of Ted's passing. While we understand the idea of promoted to glory, the sadness left behind is all too real. I treasure all the moments with Ted and you, Eva. Ted was a humble expert, which is a rarity. I think of Ted whenever I listen to New York staff band recording. He always made us sound better than we were. From Darren and Denise Waterworth of Australia, thanks for sharing your sad news. I hope all those special and happy memories of Ted will bring you some comfort in these days. Always good memories of our time in Elora with Ted and you, Eva, especially visits to the coffee shop. Finally, a message from the Volstrom family of Sweden. Here comes a greeting from Sweden. We want to express how grateful we are to have known Ted as our good friend. We think of all the good memories and the times we have shared over the years, from the holidays we shared in 1980s to the production of a CD for Eva Maria and Kirsten in 2005. Not least, we are grateful for the weeks we spent together in September two years ago when Ted and you, Eva, took us around to explore the wonderful landscape of your area. We remember Ted as a good and loyal friend and an exceptionally skilled recording engineer. We stand now together with you in these days of mourning. We know that Ted will be missed, but we rejoice in the hope of a reunion on the day of resurrection. May God bless you all.
Howard Dick for about 10 of the years that I was at the CBC. Unfortunately, Bob Cooper is unable to be here this morning as he has been called to conduct his Chorus Niagara in another memorial service in St. Catherine this very morning that arose last week after he had accepted Eva's kind offer to speak today. He asked me to extend his sincere apologies. Uh, his thoughts are with us here today, and he has asked me to read his reflections on his 30 years working with Ed. Bob says, my first assignment was to shadow the revered music producer James Kent, along with a recording engineer I had heard about but not yet met, Ed Marshall. It was a Massey Hall Toronto Symphony concert. There I sat tucked into the corner of this closet-sized recording booth overlooking the stage, mute and observant, while I watched Ed's tidily prepared board cables tape, duck, tape decks in anticipation of Mr. Kent's arrival. When he appeared dapper with his scores and a little bag of snacks. Introductions were made, headsets put on, and the concert began. For two hours, nothing or very little was being said. No instructions to address this or that instrument. How strange. Not at all, as I expected, as the newbie producer. The lesson learned, stay out of the way and let Ed do what he does so expertly. Another memory from Bob. Now it was time for my first major recording assignment. It was March 1980, and the decision was to record the national anthem with choir and orchestra in umpteen versions, both English and French, with the aim of sending LPs out to schools across Canada. Now it was just myself with the Ed Marshall. Again, we were at Massey Hall. Our cubby hole recording booth was tidily prepared by Ed, and my scores were close at hand. A huge orchestra, massed choir, don't screw up, Bob, I said to myself. Ed would occasionally ask me, what do you think, Bob? Having already forgotten my earlier lesson, I proceeded to ask about, well, what about a little more bass there? Or a little less brass? What do you think of the soprano blend? And ever more harp glissando? Ed would let me hear my suggestions, and I quickly realized the naivete of my observations. Eventually, boxes of LPs arrived at the radio building in, uh, in our new improved national anthems for all to enjoy. The sound was glorious. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, the federal government changed the words to O Canada. <laughs> and the boxes remained stacked for years in a corner of radio music. In fact, they're probably still there. Another one of Bob's memories, another first. The Canadian Opera Company was going to have a regular season on Saturday afternoon at the opera. These live performances with big orchestras, international soloists, large choruses required the ears and sensibility of her sound that, to my mind, only Ed could provide. For 10 years, Ed recorded some of the most thrilling and glorious of Canadian operatic performances. His discipline was always in evidence. He would take a whole day to set up in the O'Keefe Center. While some technicians might relax with a quick dinner before the evening recording session, not Ed. We made up for it, however, with our quick intermission run to Shopsy's for that huge slab of carrot cake dripping with pounds of cream cheese icing. <laughs> I can still see in my mind's eye Ed's delight as we downed these calories with great pleasure. In the summer of 1991, we were off to the Salzburg Festival and the Mozart 200th anniversary celebrations. With seven, uh, seven operas to broadcast, we knew we needed hours of color. Ed was a trooper, picking up sounds of horses' hooves on the cobblestone streets, catching our guide's commentary as we visited Mozart's birth house, capturing the delights of the famous Mozart Kugel factory, and of course skulking backstage uh, uh, to gather interviews from all the artists. But the real task lay in our return home. With only a week to prepare, we had to work feverishly to edit and assemble all our various mixes. It was now day one of our live-to-air seven-day Mozart marathon. Ed, ever diligently, was quietly editing in the new digital suite on Jarvis Street. I was in another studio monitoring a dubbing. Don't ask me how it happened, but I stupidly, inadvertently touched a button. I rushed to Ed. He looked at me, slowly shook his bowed head, came over with me to Studio 206. His voice was calm. You're not supposed to touch any buttons. <laughs> 
Ed readjusted the tape decks, got the dubbing restarted, and saved the opening broadcast. His quiet calm was palpable. Nothing more was said, but I felt the silence to my very core. How could I have let Ed down? There was the lesson. Ed was never one to rant, to belittle, to patronize. His professionalism and respect for others was omnipresent. In the spring of 1997, Ed and I were assigned to record a program of Canadian art songs with the renowned Canadian Heldon tenor John Vickers. Off we went to Caledon and Mr. Vickers' sprawling farm. His living room was to be our concert hall. With Ed's wizardry in full flight in the mobile, we were able to achieve an attractive sound despite the frequent bump and bonk by flies against the microphones. In three days of recording, we, we headed back for post-production. Uh, at this stage of Vickers' career, his voice was in a slow decline, and these art song miniatures were delivered with many variants of vocal poise, from the clarion ring of his held tenor to half-voice sotto voce murmurs. This was an editing nightmare. Ed spent hours stitching together single measures, even single notes, to try to create an organic whole. Ed's mastery is there for all to hear. It is a testament to his incredible patient skill and a living legacy to his recording genius. We did so many choral recordings and broadcasts. Elmer Eisler singers, Tudor singers, Vancouver Chamber Choir, Mandelson Choir, Nikki Goldschmidt's wonderful international choral festivals, and our very early morning Easter sunrise broadcasts. Ed's passion for the voice and seeking that natural choral bloom was always his goal. But the choral sound did have its competition. One Easter Sunday stands out. We were at Roy Thompson Hall to record the Earl's Court Band of the Toronto Mendelssohn Choir with Len Ballantyne and the Elmer Eisler Singers. It was a glorious day. The sound was thrilling. Ed, always enthusiastic and enjoying this oral majesty, never failed to edge up the slider on his favorite of all instruments, the trombones. <laughs> and they soared with all the majesty they could manage. Live to air broadcasts were always exciting. Stratford Festival, GNS Productions, the CBC Choral Competitions, Royal Galas, and especially our eight hour EDU Joy to the World Marathon. There was always some anxiety during these broadcasts. The need to be always on time and never caught by the top of the clock. Preparation and calm had to reign and Ed was the king of calm, methodical, precise, patient, and professional. These were the hallmarks of success. After leaving the CBC, Ed continued his recording career to even greater demand and acclaim with his martial arts productions. And we continued our journey as Ed would come and record my choirs. Ed was so highly valued and sought after because of his keen ear, technical expertise, oral excellence, and that professionalism. All this time he was fighting with such courage, strength, and face, uh, faith, the scourge of cancer that eventually took him from us. But it was Ed the person whose memory I will always challenge the most, his quiet, understated, self-effacing percep self perceptiveness. Warm, sincere, caring, open, his gentle chuckle, his ever youthful smile, his bright eyes, he had an aura. He was authentic. All of those of us who had the great fortune to be within his orbit have been blessed by his presence and his time with us. I think Bob's favorite Brazilian novelist, Paulo Coelho, summarizes best for he, me Ed's life's legacy. The world is changed by your example, not by your opinion. Thank you very much. The words of Robert Cooper. reading from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. 
He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. I knew Ed for just the last 13 years. Many of you, as we've heard, knew him much longer. I'm honored to have been invited to offer this tribute. Almost at once, I was impressed by Ed's generosity of spirit, freedom from all pretension, and gentle good humor. In time, he became one of my dearest friends. In his company, I knew a peace and contentment, a delight in just being together, endlessly good conversation, the joy of being alive in God's good world. To know Ed was to know his love for his family, how his face would light up as he shared his latest video of his grandchildren, Xavier and Felix, his pride and joy. To know Ed was to know and grow in one's appreciation for music. We've heard of his extraordinary achievements as a recording engineer. Many of you have listened in to Ed's endlessly fascinating, often amusing anecdotes regarding some of the world's greatest and not so great musicians, <laughs> concert halls, and performances. But for all that, Never once did I glimpse even an iota of ego, vanity, conceit in Ed's storytelling. I want to say he was one of the most truly modest, self-effacing persons I've ever known. But I want to say that without compromising Ed's strength of character. His modesty wasn't false, not born of a sense of inferiority. Rather, it came of a recognition that the more you see and hear and know, the more you know there is to know. He never felt he'd arrived or mastered anything, but was always expanding his horizons, eager to learn more. Before I leave the theme of music, I want to say something else. Ed was an extraordinary recording engineer and loved exploring the latest technological developments, but never as an end in itself the musicians he worked with acknowledged his determination to put his expertise at the service of the music and those performing it. And that was because he loved music. Among the happiest times of my life, I count the numerous occasions I spent with Ed and his and my very dear friend, Christine Mather. Every three or four weeks, we gathered Ed's home listen to a collection of his or my CDs and watch a, or watch a Mozart opera on DVD. After two or three hours listening, dear Eva would have prepared a delicious lunch, always with a good dessert, 
which the four of us would share around their dining table. They were occasions that taught me what one means when one speaks of kindred spirits, except when it came to Wagner. <laughs> Finally, to know Ed was to know a man of God. I loved to hear accounts from him of the Monday night Bible study he and Eva attended together for so many years, working through whole books of the Old and New Testaments, one chapter at a time, Ezekiel, chapter by chapter. All of you who were part of that were very dear to him. One of Ed's important discoveries in the past several years was the German theologian, pastor, and martyr, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He read his biography, some of his books, and loved reading through his collections of excerpts from his writings for the seasons of Advent and Lent. As well as his regular Sunday attendance, he was with Christine, Fred, and Doris, one of the most faithful attendees at daily morning prayer, Monday to Friday, at St. John's Church. But for me, the most precious times of all were those he and I would spend after sharing a cup of coffee from his coffee maker, of which he was so proud. We'd read a passage of scripture and then we'd pray, times that became increasingly precious as Ed's cancer took the greater hold of him. Then he and I experienced a holiness, a sacredness in our companionship, a cherishing of one another that tasted of eternity. Our Lord Jesus, inexhaustible gift. Ed, let me paraphrase your beloved Bonhoeffer and say, this is the end for you the beginning of life. I invite you to stand for the singing of the next song.
We've already heard uh, from a lot of people about their clear and vivid memories of my dad, but I've always had a conflicting mental picture of my dad. See, I've always pictured him as the quiet, almost stoic figure with superhuman patience and an impossible attention to whatever task was in front of him. On the other hand, he could ramble on and on at great length about his newest gadgets or technologies acquired, a newly discovered Japanese restaurant, or stories from a recent trip across town or overseas. Nevertheless, when it came to knowing and understanding my dad, it was what you see is what you get. It was no secret that my dad was an easy mark for new technology, and he always seemed to have some new interesting thing to bring home. When he got his first CD player connected to our living room sound system, which featured left and right channel subwoofers, <laughs> he had endless delight playing a recording of a Boeing 747 <laughs> passing overhead. He would make the windows of our house rattle for everyone that came to visit, and he laughed every time. <laughs> you might think my dad was the best at what he did, but my family can tell you that this is not true. He was not the best at checking that the cap on the ketchup bottle was secure before shaking it violently <laughs> in front of a painted white dining room wall. He was not the best at toggling the record and pause button on our Sony video camera during va family vacations, collecting minutes of walking feet <laughs> and absent sights. Well, aside from the red face, and he just give us that little shrug, oh, oh well. Growing up with dad provided unique opportunities um, for, for Paula and I uh, to experience things that other kids might not have or care for. By the third grade, we both had a functional understanding of sound waves and knew the difference between reverberation and echo. I don't think we either, either of us used the front door to a concert hall in the city until we were well past university. <laughs> and watching me help tear down after a concert one night, an impressed CBC colleague said, I must have been born wrapping cables. Dad was instrumental in connecting us with the people that could nurture our own music making. Paula trained with Rivka Golani um, before pursuing ethnomusicology and pop music studies at Western. And I was introduced to the members of Nexus Percussion Ensemble shortly after I picked up my first pair of drumsticks. We rubbed elbows with some of the finest musicians, conductors, composers, and educators in the country, if not in the world. But none of this went to our heads. It was just the way it was. It was just the world that dad was in, lived in, and he brought us into it naturally. Dad was always trying to teach us things. He'd stop to explain how things worked, anything from cardioid mics to wind, uh, wind over the airplane uh, wings to create lift. But the real lessons that he taught us were the ones that were not spoken. They were absorbed. When we listened to him, to him talk on and on, showing his latest gadgets, we'd learn about passion. Whatever you're interested in and passionate about, share it with others and be interested in what they're interested in. When we laughed at his clumsy mistakes, as embarrassed as he'd be, he taught us to be humble, accept them, learn from them, and move on. When we saw him at work, we learned that you should not try to be the best, but to do the best for the sake of those around you. 
Dad never bragged about the things that he had done in his career. In fact, not until just recently, I had no idea of the scope of the influence that he's had on the recording and music industries. Dad always talked about his, when Dad talked about his work, he always talked about the people that he got to work with. The, he was always impressed with their creativity and their skill. And he talked about how lucky he was to have gotten to know you personally. Dad has left a huge legacy behind. And perhaps that's an un, a gross understatement. I can't imagine trying to have the same impact that he has had on the world. But I'm gonna take those lessons that he's left me and I'm gonna teach them to my boys. I'm gonna make sure they learn about their grandpa, about his passions, his calm, his calm, his brilliance, and how to find their own. And yes, I am going to teach them to check the bottle before shaking the ketchup. Thank you. Uh, when we were growing up, there was a community swimming pool just up a couple blocks up the street from our house. And in the hot, sticky summer days before central air conditioning, we would all traipse up there in the evening for family swim time. Uh, so it was the summer when I was, I think, about four years old. My dad would stay in the shallow end with me, and he did this thing where he would crouch down on the side of the pool, and he would help me stand up on his knees. Um, and he would sway and twist around, and I thought this was hilarious. And at some unexpected moment, he would jump up and toss me backwards into the water, which was so much fun. I would just climb right back up and make him do it again and again and again. So as we were, we were reflecting this summer on various stories from our childhood, I began to realize so many things could have gone wrong with this. <laughs> I didn't know how to swim. <laughs> uh, my arms would be flailing uncontrollably. I had no idea what was behind me. Uh, so I asked him, what on earth were you thinking doing this? And he gave that little half shrug that he always did and said, well, I could see behind you. I knew it was safe to go, let you go. And I realized in that moment that my whole life I've had this absolute trust that my dad would keep me safe. Whatever calamity I found myself in, and there were many, usually involving my car breaking down at the side of the road, he would reassure me that, yeah, this, this is not good, but it's going to be OK. So a passage of scripture has been coming through my mind over and over and over this summer. And it was written at a time when the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. They had lost everything. They were suffering. They didn't think that there was any way that this could get better. But they still had a hope and a trust in their Heavenly Father, who loved them and was somehow going to make this OK. So as much as I trusted my dad to keep me safe, I cling to the same trust and hope that is expressed in Lamentations 3, verses 19 to 21. It reads, the thought of my suffering and homelessness is beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Amen.
Ted and I shared a lot of interests, obviously. In order to last 49 years together, you have to. But there was one thing that we both hated. And I was this side of the microphone. <laughs> if you ever saw Ted behind a microphone, you would have seen him cringe, literally. However, here I am, and I will try my best. Ted, my husband, we had an arranged marriage. I'm going to tell you how it happened. Some of you will know how we met, others not. Some have heard a different version of the truth, so I will tell you what really happened, because I was there. In 1965, the Salvation Army celebrated it its first 100 years with a huge international congress in London, England. Among the bands invited from around the world was Earl Scott Band of the Salvation Army in Toronto. And there was a delegation there from Sweden as well, of which I was part. My friend Eva and I decided we wanted to be part of this. We were 16 on the condition that we saved up enough money to go for the trip and under the supervision of our divisional commanders slash bishops, for those of you who are not familiar with the terminology, we were allowed to go. We were on fire for God and for the Salvation Army. Boys were the last thing of our minds. On our second night in London, we decided to go out for something to eat, and we invited another girl who was our age to come with us. We were still in our distinctive Swedish red blouses, tunics, uh, so anybody that saw us within the Salvation Army would know that we were from Sweden. We had our bonnets on, the whole kit and caboodle. And as we were walking down the street, there were three young men coming up on the other side of the street. They did not have uniforms on, so we had no idea who they were. As they crossed the street, I turned to Eva and I said, one day I'm going to marry him, indicating Ted. No chance for her to reply, because here they are now having crossed the street. And Ted says, hi, I'm Ted from Toronto, in Canada. And these are my friends, Bob and Walter. Somehow I got conned into or pushed into the center and I'm with my very halting school English say, hi, I am Eva from Sweden. This is my friend Eva and this is my friend Eva. <laughs> Newhart had that line, didn't you? Uh-uh. Sorry. No. Nope. You know, it took a while to convince them, but it was the truth. It was a very common name in, in those years when we were born. What can I say? Anyway, uh, we didn't find anything to eat that night. And our DC slash bishop had a lot of explaining to do when the letters started to come. After four years of letter writing, we were married in Sweden. At that time, my friend Eva, the first one, <laughs> reminded me of, a, of the comment that I had made that night in London. Had we ever doubted that that would happen? Ted didn't. I did. I actually tried to break up once and wrote a letter to that effect. The second I dropped it in a mailbox, it was like someone hit my head and said, what on earth are you doing? So I ran home, wrote another letter, dashed back out only to see the yellow mail, mail truck drive off having emptied the mailbox. So poor Ted had to wait for another day or two before he got my letter, but he forgave me. So 49 years later, was this a perfect marriage? I'm not sure there is such a thing. Everybody has their ups and downs and we did too. However, we never doubted that we belonged together. We celebrated Ted's birthday with a small family dinner just 
this year. He had just come home from the hospital that day before he went in for the final round. I thought I should at least get a birthday card. And I thought, I'll get a funny one for the little boy, boy's sake more than anything, right? So I walked into our local grocery store and went where the funny birthday cards are. And lo and behold, this is what my hands landed on. And I'm gonna read just what it says on the front, not the inside, sorry. To my husband, God wanted us to be together. I believe with all my heart, our love was meant to be. I believe that our first kiss was as much part of God's plan as the starry scar, star, sorry, as the stars in the night sky. And I believe that the life we share reflects his love day by day. I thank you, God, for you with all my soul and love you with all my heart. And then I wrote some more. So you see, our marriage was arranged by our Heavenly Father. We never doubted that. So you've heard about Ted, Ed, the father, brother, colleague, friend, grandfather, husband. But what was he really like behind all that? All his life, he was a child of God. From his dedication as a baby in the Salvation Army and onwards, never stopped believing in God. He didn't often speak of his faith, faith openly, but some events certainly brought him closer to God. One such was the death of his mother. Shortly afterwards, he decided to join our York Minster Bible study that we heard Patrick speak about earlier. He had hunger for the word of God. He wanted to know more and more. And that's when he started to read uh, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Martin Luther was another one of his favorites, and Eric Metaxas. After we moved to Elora, he decided he wanted to get baptized. He wanted to confirm his faith. And that he did in 2004 and it really affected him very deeply. But I think the strongest impact um, that I know of was when we went to Germany in 2010 and we saw the Omber Amigal Passion Play. It's a play that displays the last week of Christ's life on earth. And as we heard the nails being sort of hammered in during the crucifixion scene, no one was unmoved. But every Good Friday after that, tears would literally run down his cheeks as the choir would sing the reproaches, oh my children, what have I done to you? Or, or and, were you there when they crucified my Lord? He remembered deeply what Christ had done for him. He felt God's presence in his life even if he didn't always talk about it. And no more so than this last year, especially the last six weeks when he was in the hospital. He would tell anyone who came near, I want to go home. That's with a capital H, not home to me. And now he has. One day when I was a bit upset about this coming goodbye, because I've never liked goodbyes. It doesn't matter who it is, I just don't like goodbyes. He said, Eva, it's not a goodbye, it's see you later. And I'm sure I will. My question to you is, will you say see you later? Thank you. All the way to front. Well, thank you, Eva, for setting us straight about your marriage and for telling us something that we might have missed today about the depth of his faith. And I want to say something which will prepare you for the drama and the, uh, the dynamics of the music you're going to hear next. And if you truly uh, understand what Eva was talking about in terms of Ted's faith, then you'll understand that the music that you're going to hear tells a story of great uh, compulsion. 
in Matthew's gospel, he took great pains to speak to the Jewish people. Therefore, the images, the, um, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, a fishing net, a, a seed, a pearl, uh, a treasure. Um, these images were uh, simple images for people to understand, but to also create a, a film of mystery around what the kingdom might look like. Now, this music seeks to bring the kingdom of God to a, uh, a visualization that we seldom can imagine for ourselves. But with the compelling music of Eric Ball and some wonderful Advent tunes and uh, tunes that display the life of Christ, through to his crucifixion and death and resurrection, we get a panoply, a beautiful multi-vistaed color vision of who this Jesus was, who was so compelling then, now, and in the future kingdom.
Stand with me. Join me with prayer. Lord, you have lifted us through human music making and prayers and thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you for the expression of grateful hearts as we played and sang and recited our thoughts. Thank you for the inspiration for all, the inspiration to live well and steadily and at peace with all people. We give you the glory for creating such a magnificent human being and allowing us to be his friend. Thank you, Lord. And now as we fellowship together over the good things that you have supplied, continue to nourish us for today and tomorrow. Allow us to feel the community of faith that is here, a sense of your spirit abiding with us. These have been sacred moments, Lord. And our prayer is that we will be somehow strangely changed for having enjoyed them together. Let it be so. Amen. Please remain standing for the choral benediction. Join us with refreshments. <laughs> <laughs>